Um, thank you so much for that kind introduction, and thank you for all of the great work you're doing to ensure that London remains competitive and open to talent, things that are very, very close to my heart, um, especially given that we have 22 nationalities at Improbable, um, many of whom post-Brexit were not the happiest people in the world. So excited and hopeful that we can, uh, we can resolve things. So I'm here to talk to you about Improbable, and I think it might be worth a brief introduction as to who we are and what we do. Um, we're about five years old. We originally started in my uh, parents' house, so very glamorous uh, beginnings. Not a garage, actually a barn. Um, more British, I think, in its, in its origins. And our goal was really to look at an area that me and my co-founders had been very interested in in academia, but didn't really see much progress in, in the commercial world, which is a field called distributed computation. So in particular, we were interested in how you go about using thousands of machines to work on problems that traditionally haven't been easy to cut up and scale. And why that's important is because if you want to do things like simulate cities, or model teleco networks, or start to model human cells, you need a powerful way to solve exactly those kinds of problems. Now, one of the challenges with, with working in distributed computation is that nobody really seems to care about this fundamental building block technology. Um, people care a lot about AI, about VR, about autonomous vehicles. And we find ourselves at Improbable in this strange space where we're working on these foundational ideas that don't directly change people's lives, but have the indirect power to do so. And, and that's really important because it sort of made us very aware of how some fields and areas can get neglected, misunderstood. And that's why in today's talk, what I want to talk about isn't um, simulating cities and modeling networks and being able to improve decision making. It's actually an area that is a big focus for us and something which I think should be more of a focus for everyone in this room. I want to talk to you about video games. So who here plays video games? You are not a representative sample of the world. Um, about 2.6 billion people play games. 2.6 billion people play games. Some of the poorest and richest people in the world play games. It's drastically important to our society in a way that we need to wake up to. And my prediction is that video games are going to completely alter the way our culture operates. Now, why do I say that? Well, I mean, yes, of course, it's a big industry. It's more than $100 billion. Um, it's growing ridiculously fast, and it continues to grow year on year and has done for 40 years at a rate that would make anyone uh, interested in investing in it very excited. Um, the total number of gamers seem to grow virally. When you've become a gamer once, you seem to stay a gamer for the rest of your life. Your kids often become gamers. Um, quite an amazing and strange one-time switch in our culture. But why I think it's so important is that it's beginning to go beyond play. Video games and game worlds, as we would see them at Improbable, they're starting to produce behavior that doesn't look just like people entertaining themselves by engaging with the game directly. We're beginning to see players become more than players, become professionals become creators, start contributing back to game worlds, starting to make money from becoming pro gamers. Uh, some of the biggest pro gamers in the world make millions of dollars. Some people are even making money watching uh, by basically creating streams of themselves playing games while other people watch. Uh, many of you might be familiar with Amazon's acquisition of Twitch for a billion dollars, which now seems like a small price to pay for how massive uh, video game streaming is becoming. So the prediction I would make is that what we're about to see is a further transformation from video games and associated uh, ecosystem activities that are all about play to games that become more like worlds. Games in which value can actually be created. Jobs, perhaps, could be had. Experiences can occur which can blend the boundaries between simply passively consuming something and actually having meaningful experiences, engaging with worlds in a way that people previously haven't seen, haven't encountered. And to make that happen, a sort of technological transformation is happening behind the scenes in the games industry. And you might think that I'm talking about VR here, but I'm not. Because the key isn't necessarily how we immerse ourselves in these worlds. It's what these worlds themselves allow for. And the big changes that we're beginning to see and that the industry is moving towards include things like massive scale. For the first time, we're seeing game worlds that are actually gigantic, that contain millions of entities and players, that actually have the means to produce complex systems that look like some of the complex systems that exist in the real world. But typically, 
this type of play has been very hard, and these types of games have been very challenging to create. It's why we haven't seen this behavior to date. And the thing that you know, we believe will change everything is where our talk began, distributed computation. This somewhat unsexy but very important idea is one of the limiting factors in building truly exciting virtual worlds. Because a virtual world, like a simulation of a city or a model of a network, is intrinsically hard to scale. It has millions of interactive components in the form of players with their devices, engaging with a world which is always changing, which needs to stay in sync, and which needs to handle vast volumes of data and computation. So the technology that underpins what we're doing at Improbable with our product Spatial OS and other changes that are happening in the ecosystem are going to make possible games that instead of running on a single game engine or server begin to run across thousands of machines simultaneously, exponentially increasing the complexity of those game worlds, the activities that are possible within them, and the nature of the economies and ecosystems that they're going to support. So if that sounds a little bit crazy, um, I think what might make you feel even more uncomfortable is how rapidly this is going to happen. Uh, games have a very odd property. They grow suddenly. When a great game comes out, like Pokemon Go, the, num the numbers spike insanely. Um, for those of you who've heard of Blair Unknown's Battlegrounds, has anyone heard of this game? Very, very few people. Um, but if you look at its uh, growth curve, uh, it's now the largest game on Steam. Uh, the rate at which it's been adopted is insane. This was made by a small team in South Korea, and within just a few months, it's become exponentially gigantic. It's become a cultural phenomenon. There's people today, right now at this moment, there are millions of people streaming and watching each other playing in this game. Um, so my prediction is, as these new types of games, which will take advantage of distributed computation, which will have activities in them that we haven't yet seen before, as they begin to come out and we see the odd hit, the drastic change it could have in our society could happen very, very quickly and could alter people's lives very rapidly indeed. So I want to talk a little bit about the singularity. And you know, my investor, Masayoshi-san, talks often about this. And it's an idea I've been thinking about a lot myself. What it should mean to people beyond a world where AI and autonomous systems create enormous wealth and productivity is a world where human beings have very little to do. Um, jobs are going to be automated at a fairly frightening rate. I, I think everyone here has some experience of you know, the different trends in our society that are leading us to this direction. I think gaming could be a very important antidote to some of the challenges we might encounter in an automated society. Game worlds represent a place where labor doesn't really need to be automated. There's no point automating labor within a virtual world. Um, the kinds of activities that game worlds support, the sorts of value creation they support, are intrinsically resistant to AI. They're in fact a kind of wonderfully, a wonderfully quintessentially human activity. It's our culture abstracted away from the real world, put into a form where people can create value and engage with each other in unimaginable ways. So as this future comes about, and as automation takes place, I think games are going to become an increasingly important antidote and part of our society. Maybe even a very important place where, in an increasingly divided society, empathy and understanding and interaction across societal boundaries become possible. Um, who would have thought video games could save the world, but perhaps they can. Um, lastly, I want to talk a little bit about what the far future might look like. So now here we do need to bring back VR and AI and all of the technologies that are going to be talked about over the next couple of days. In the far future, we should start to see virtual worlds which go well beyond even what I'm talking about today. Um, artificial realities, places we can engage with as fully as with the real world. Pick your sci-fi of choice, whether it's The Matrix or William Gibson or Ready Player One. Uh, there's no technological fundamental constraint that means those futures are impossible. So we have to assume they will come about. And when they do, we have to wonder what our lives might be like. And I make this prediction. I don't think virtual worlds will replace the real world. I think we will find ourselves living these interesting multiversal lives, jumping between worlds, engaging with people and with activities that today we can scarcely imagine, but all happening in the context of a much larger, more rich experience of life. That's my prediction. Thank you.